year. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to share a few notes on the current Liberian policy as it relates to the fight against the proliferation of counterfeit medicines and expired medical products in Liberia. Um, alors, pour la présentation de ce and then the role of the parliament in the fight against counterfeit and aspired medicines. We will also look at the regulatory challenges in West Africa, and then hopefully to conclude, uh, and then we will open up for comments or so. Uh, as a background, in 2007, uh, there was a European Union delegation to Liberia that did an assessment on the pharmaceutical sector. And out of that assessment came a report, and in that report, it was recommended to the Liberian government that uh, the pharmaceutical sector, looking at what it was then, needed to be broken down into four major components as a way of addressing some of the biggest, some of the challenges we had then. So that, to those, among those recommendations, it was suggested that the Minister of Health, uh, with a division of pharmacy, look at policy issue in the office of the chief pharmacy. And then the Liberia Pharmacy Board should address the issue of a professional licensing. That is, the people who are involved in the handling of medicines should be licensed to do what they do based on their competence and their training. And then the National Drug Service, which is a central medical store in many countries, uh, in Liberia, we have the National Drug Service to be challenged with the responsibility of looking at public procurement of medicines, medicine storage, and also medicine distribution around the country, including vaccines. And then the fourth component of that recommendation said that there should be a new medicines regulatory authority set up, that is the LMHRA today, to be in charge of medicines registration, input and export control, inspection, post-market surveillance, and quality control activities, among others. This was necessary because most of the mandate to be undertaken by this new medicine regulatory authority were either enshrined or implied in the Pharmacy Act of the Public Health Law of Liberia of 1976. The committee, which is the Medicine Regulatory Committee, was set up in 2008 by the Minister of Health, and its first mandate was to develop a drug regulation of legislation and regulation that would be tailored to the realities of Liberia at the time. Thus, the first priority was the law, because without laws and regulations, any support will be ineffective. The regulation of medicines and related health products in Liberia is now governed by the provision and requirements of the Liberia Medicines and Health Products Regulatory Authority Act that was passed into law in 2010. This act was prepared in 2009 and was passed into law by the 52nd legislature in early September 2010 and got approved by the President of the Republic of Liberia on September 29, 2010. It's important to highlight this because throughout the region and other parts of Africa, there have been a challenge as it relates to the passage of these kinds of law. Regulatory acts in many countries are hanging around for, for many years. But because of the importance attached to the issue about counterfeit and substance medicine in the region, the Liberian legislature saw the need to speedily pass this act. So this act was one of the fastest that went through the House of Parliament and got approved and went into full swing by 2010, which was a record set. In many countries where we have presented this, people have held the Liberian legislature 
for doing a wonderful job and passing this act within a very short period of time. So hats off to the national legislation for this. The purpose of the act was to ensure that in a national medicine supply system, only safe, effective, and good quality medicines are allowed to reach the Liberian public. The second was to protect the Liberian and is to protect the Liberian public from the harmful effect of substandard and counterfeit medicines and health products. Also to ensure fair trade practices in medicines and health products. In addition, to promulgate regulations to fight illegal trade in medicines, including counterfeit and adulterated medicines and health products. To conduct or facilitate necessary research and development promote pharmacovigilance and disseminate timely drug information to the public. This was our public, I mean, purpose of the act. Now, what is the issue as it relates to medicines and public health? Why, why is medicine important to public health? Public health emphasizes mainly on diseases, disease prevention and control. And the intervention in most instances is concentrated on immunization and vaccination preventive care, public health education and sanitation, the use of devices and tests, surgery, etc. But in spite of all of this, diseases will always strike anyway, no matter what we do. So drug treatment is eminent and unavoidable. Whatever we do or what, whether we like it or not, we always need drugs or medicines to, to save ourselves from the effect of diseases. So drug regulation and quality issues always been an afterthought in many public health interventions until recently when governments, donor agencies, and development partners, etc., begin to highlight the importance of quality. So most of the time, as technicians and others, when we sit, the questions normally is, the, so many questions come, and some of the questions include, what if, if there were no drugs? You can imagine what would happen to humanity in the midst of diseases. And what is if all medicines or all drugs were of poor quality, that is they were considered counterfeit or ineffective or unsafe? These are all questions that will ponder on the minds of people. What is if there were no drug regulatory authorities or no drug regulation or quality control mechanism in the world to make sure that people who produce or sell medicines around the world do the right thing? So the question would be then why should we regulate medicines in fact? So medicines are not ordinary commercial goods. And we tend to highlight them most of the time because people who are involved in the sale of pharmaceuticals tend to think that that is just another way of earning a living. If you don't succeed in uh, stationaries, general merchandise, you can go directly into the sale of medicines and make money. So we are saying medicines are not commercial, ordinary commercial goods like clothes, stationaries, etc. The use of medicine is for the good of the public and should not be left to the market forces of, of demand and supply. Suppliers in that instance may supply anything and consumers will consume whatever is available, whether good or bad. So then the burden on individuals and government health budget will increase due to induced diseases, drug-induced diseases. And drug-induced diseases can be many of such. We can talk about them more and more. You have things like severe adverse reactions as a, as a result of using maybe the wrong drug, or maybe overdose. Uh, there can be prolonged hospital stay, which can cost government a lot of money. So instead of saving money by making sure that the med medications that we use are safe and are of good quality, if we have the wrong medication, they may just induce, induce drug-induced diseases and will cause prolonged hospital stay, and then government have to spend millions of dollars trying to save life. Informed and uninformed patients may buy ineffective or counterfeit medicines because they just don't know. Now, in this case, it's not about education, it's not about your economic status, but it's about the quality of what you buy. If people are not prepared to put into place a mechanism so that whatever we find on our market is of the right quality, we may just spend money buying the wrong kinds of medication, which can be detrimental to our health. 
Counterfeit or expired medicines such as antibiotics, antimalarials, etc., can have serious implications for public and for public health. Antibiotics, for example, are key among many kinds of different drugs that we are talking about these days. The World Health Organization in December of 2015 launched what they call Antibiotic Resistance Day. And the reason for that is that currently it's been highlighted that by 2020, 70% of all of the antibiotics we use, including ampicillin, penicillin, and, uh, amoxicillin, you name them, will become resistant, meaning they will not cure the diseases that we currently suffer today because antimicrobial resistance is a growing concern globally. So we are beginning to think there is a global call now that uh, people need to design new antibiotics to fight against the diseases that we currently face with. So it's an uphill challenge because of the counterfeiting of antibiotics, substandard antibiotics, the spy antibiotics, and the misuse and abuse of antibiotics is a growing concern, especially in developing countries and most likely in Africa and other parts of the world. In developing and less developed countries, critical medicines for public health interventions have been counterfeited, including antimalarials, ARVs for you know, HIV, TB medications, antibiotics, etc. They are all being counterfeited in their numbers because this is a billion dollar industry now. You know, people made a lot of money from counterfeiting. And you, you may counterfeit other things, but in, as it relates to medicine, it's a, it's a critical area, and we should not leave any corridor. No window of opportunity should be left for counterfeiters to track in this area. Because by doing so, you put in people's lives at risk, and there can be medical emergency that we may not have the opportunity to intervene, and we can lose, lose many lives in a very short period of time. What this slide shows photograph of different medication that have been counterfeited in the public health sector that were discovered between 2012 to 2015. At the level of the World Health Organization, there is an alert system. This alert system has been organized so that member countries, if you find out that in your supply system, any of these products show up, and by quality control analysis through laboratory means, you detect that uh, they fall short of the quality they can be reported through the WHO alert system, and this alert system can capture the specific information as it relates to these products, and they can be disseminated wide across the world to other member countries so that they too can check their supply system and find out as to whether they have similar products circulating or not. So most of the photos shown there, you can see the red marks uh, behind those photographs showing specifically some of the countries in West Africa. Um, in the Côte d'Ivoire, some of these things were found, and then uh, it was brought to the public attention, and then people started to search to find out whether we had, you know, some of these problems, I mean, situations around us or not. Uh, since we are highlighting the issue of Liberia, these products that is being pointed here were found on the Liberian uh, market in the national supply system. And the, the worst scenario about it is that the ambulances that you find on these packages are WHO ambulances. Under the essential medicine program of WHO, there is a specific logo that is designed to be placed on public health commodity, public health drugs. So the medicines that we normally buy using government funds or donor funds are specially labeled in this format so that the government buy specifically this product to be used in the public health facilities, in hospitals, in our clinics and health centers. So you see that there is a uniformity as it relates to the packaging across countries. Okay. But in our country, we found this screening through our post-market surveillance from the regulatory authority. We found out that you see two different colors. One is white, one is yellow. But they have the same labeling, except that they are different in color. But then the information was that these drugs were made by the same manufacturer on the same date, and they had the same batch number which by good manufacturing practice is not possible because it's not possible to have a batch of medication passing through the machine at the same time, but then showing two different color and, and uh, you know, two different tablet size. Even if you took the size of the tablet, they are different. We didn't stop there from visual inspection. We took them to our lab and did quality analysis on these things. 
and we found out that they had less than 10% of active pharmaceutical ingredients. Meaning, even though they were labeled 300 milligram quinine, but if you check, you actually found less than 10 milligrams of quinine. So all people with malaria cases that were using these medications to treat their malaria will not get well. If the symptom went away, it will go away for only a few days, and less than a week, there will be a resurface of the malaria attack, and this patient, these patients that are likely to use these medications stand a high risk of dying from malaria because they didn't get cured. Worse of it, after a prolonged use of these kinds of medication, there is a likelihood of resistance. Resistance will set in because the, the, the organism in the body will adjust itself technically so that the next time you come short, I mean you fall ill with malaria and you wanted to treat the plasmodium falciparum with this kind of drug, it will not work because there will be a mechanism of resistance that has been designed by the organism. So nothing works. The state of medicine regulations in Africa, or specifically West Africa. We, we talk about West Africa because currently, as we speak, there is an ongoing collaboration between countries among ourselves. We have bigger brothers, meaning there are countries that have bigger you know, muscles in terms of their regulatory framework. They are much stronger than smaller countries. Nigeria with NAFTA, uh, followed by Ghana with FDA, Ghana FDA. Uh, we started initially with about seven countries, mainly seven to eight countries, the Anglophone and Lusophone country, including one Francophone country, Guinea. But then as time went by, we started to uh, put our hairs together, and today we have almost all of the West African countries that have started to be a part of the West African medicine harmonization, harmonization process. So we do have meetings two, three times a year. We have technical committees looking at different aspects, medicine registration, pharmacovigilance, post-market surveillance, you name it. So we are all challenged about, we all have similar challenges across West Africa. Unapproved, unregistered medicines are circulating on our markets. In most of the medicines circulating on our market are not registered and they enter the country illegally. Take Liberia for example, for, as an example. We are flanked by three neighboring countries, Africos, Guinea, Sierra Leone, we, we now have put into place a mechanism to register the medicines that are coming into our country because it is by registration that we can verify the source of the medicines and we can also authenticate the safety and the quality of the medicines. But in spite of that, we still have huge quantity of medicines illegally entering the country through our very porous borders of our neighboring countries. And uh, since we are in a forum where we need to I mean, give you the uh, realities. Our biggest challenge currently has been the huge proliferation of medicines crossing over from Guinea to Liberia on a regular basis. These medicines come by trucks at night, most of the time at night, and they are in these trucks with pepper, with plantain, and other goods, perishable goods. In the midst of these goods, you have medicines that should be stored under very uh, regulated you know, temperature. But these trucks are on the, on the highway, they are driving, and dr trucks are, I mean, drivers are moving. And so the security of the medicines are being, are not, you know, much uh, paid attention to. What we've also seen, not only the security of the medicine, but the medicine themselves. In most instances, their quality are not assured, and the source of the medicines are not identified. You, you don't know which country they come from. Sometimes you see made in China or you see on the package made in India, or on some of the package you see made in the UK or made in Europe. There is no identity of the manufacturer. You cannot trace the manufacturer. You don't know the manufacturer address. So it's difficult to trace who actually produces this thing. So part of our surveillance has been to send surveillance officers even across the border into Guinea. And what we've seen is that there is a huge market where people sell medicine in the open, in the open market. So this is a big challenge that needs to be addressed. No matter what we do in Liberia, except our colleagues in Guinea also put their house in order, uh, we will continue to have an influx or cross-border activity going on continuously. So some of the manufacturers do not comply with basic good manufacturing practices, and this is key for part of regulation across the world. 
Distribution outlets do not comply with rules and regulations and standards. And then public sector procurement depends largely on prices and less on quality. And we think this is important for us to hammer. Because if we don't highlight the issue of quality and we only uh, rely on prices, you may buy something, something cheaper, but the, uh, the cheapness or the less cost it is. And if it is of poor quality, you are getting danger in the lives of those who will become end users. So we should, our emphasis should not only be on price, we should also highlight the importance of quality. We think this is very, very important. In fact, quality should supersede all other things. It doesn't matter how pricely it may be, or it should be the right quality. The market control, which is the export, input, export, and distribution, is weak, and therefore a big challenge. Drug smuggling is also an issue. Unapproved and importation, uh, uh, unapproved and importation, and theft of medicines are common. We are seeing repeatedly where most of our clinics and hospitals go stop out, meaning they, are, they don't have medicines. It's not because the government did not send medicines. It's because sometimes unscrupulous people are involved in the practice of stealing medicine from public facilities and selling it across the border. Sometimes these things happen. And as a result, there is shortage of medicine in the hospital. And hospital management are left with no stone but to take money and go in the open market to buy which is unsafe. If you buy from the community pharmacy or in the open market from a medicine shop, you don't know the quality of procurement, I mean the quality of medicines you are buying, and you are only buying on safe medication that will expose the public to, to, to a high risk. Medicines are sold by unauthorized and untrained individuals. We think this is also very, very important. People who are not trained or who don't have licenses to sell medicine should not be allowed to sell medicine. It's a crime. The, the police need to arrest these people. Because the sale of medicine is a public health. It's not an ordinary you know, commercial activity that anybody from just anywhere can just get up and take a bucket, put some medicine, and start to sell in the market. We think this is wrong. And these are some of the things that we need to really stem on so that we can deal with the issue of counterfeit and expired medicines. Also, expired medicines are being relabeled and for sale. There are instances where medicines, good medicine that, that were in the facilities or in stores, but got expired at some point. People remove them from the facilities, take them to unknown places, and relabel. So if a medicine expired 2013, the three is changed to eight, so that the new expiration date is now 2018. And somebody who doesn't have the technical expertise to, to dig deep, deeper and know what is actually the, the quality of the medicine in there may be likely carried away by the new date and assume that uh, because it's now 2018 on the label, so the medicine is suitable for consumption. There are substandard and counterfeit medicines on the informal market. The informal market are those people who sell medicine in the black bag, in the bucket, in our marketplaces, sometimes on the table. In the rural areas, if you went there, especially in the southeast, market day is one of the days where people go in the market and just spread their tapoli on the floor, and they have all kinds of medications spread around and they are selling. Some of them can hardly read and write. What do they know that, what information are they giving to the users as it relates to the use of this medication? So these are high risks that are being posed to the public there that we have to deal with. This photograph shows you one of our open markets. There are medicines all on the table. And you see young people, mostly women, uh, who can hardly read and write. I can imagine what they are telling their customers as it relates to the quality of this medication. In most cases, all of those medications are most likely to be counterfeit because the source of the medication are unreliable and their quality is seriously questioned. So again, people who are accessing these kinds of market and accessing these kinds of products are just exposed to a lot of risk and harm. So these are the issues that confront us day by day. If you look at the photograph, you see two packages, okay, of Halfan, Halfan 250 milligram, Halofantrin for malaria. Now, one is fake and one is real. But just by the mere visual inspection for those of us who are seated in this room, you can hardly look at those photographs and be able to tell which one is fake. You can hardly tell. Then most likely an ordinary citizen who is illiterate cannot read and write. How do they differentiate between what is fake and what is real? This is a big question. So the issue of a counterfeit, it, it goes far beyond just an ordinary thought. It has to be dealt with professionally and more technically because except 
you do technical inspection of these packages and even go beyond that by doing, by doing a quality analysis by laboratory means, it will be difficult for you to tell which one is real and which one is fake. Okay. So this is just one example of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of medication that are being counterfeited that are currently on our market in the region, not only in Liberia. If you look at this one, it's a lesser ring, mock watch. So people are not only counterfeiting medicines, but uh, they are counterfeiting other, other, other commodities. You know, mock watch, toothpaste, you need it. They are all being counterfeited. We are seeing on the market a lot, 80% of the perfume that we use in West Africa are counterfeited. They are not real. I have been buying a perfume called uh, One Million. It's sold normally on the flight, Kenya Airways. He paid almost, I think, 80 or 85 US dollars for that. Once upon a time, I saw one million on the Liberian market being sold, and I asked for it, and the, the, uh, this, the, the person who was selling told me that it cost $25, and I was shocked. <laughs> Something I've been buying duty-free on the air is costing me 85 US dollars, but it's being sold on the Liberian market for $25. So out of curiosity, I paid for it, and I got it. I smelled the fragrance. Of course, they have similarity in smell. I took it home and I compared the one million that I had on my counter or on my shelf with the one that I just bought. Then I started to mysteriously find different, different things. And so I went on the website of the manufacturer and started to find out. And then the manufacturer actually published that this one million among many, many other perfumes have been counterfeited around the world. Mm. It was from there that I actually saw the counterfeiting. And believe me, in spite of my level of education and all of that, I could hardly tell the difference between the real one and the counterfeited one. The only way I could tell after spraying it for a while, maybe after a few hours, you smell the fragrance and you start to see the differences in smell. And then we, we contacted many people to find out about what is the gravity of counterfeiting perfume around the world and we came to find out that China is one of the biggest, has one of the largest market for counterfeit fragrance and perfumes around the world. And in some time, they even use urine. You won't believe it. People use urine to reproduce fragrance, perfume. They use, they use very other harsh substances to put into these things so as to improve their volume and give them the kind of color they need. So when you apply them on your body, they can get induced another skin disease or even come down with uh, skin cancer in the future. <laughs> this is an issue we are dealing with. Lisa talked about women cream, body cream, body lotions, lipstick. Huge consignment being counterfeited in different parts of the world. Surprisingly for me, Colgate toothpaste that is highly sold on our market, which we go for, and we classify it as being one of the high rated toothpaste. Colgate is now being seriously counterfeited in the world. In Michigan State, in the United States of America, where, where Colgate is naturally produced, they arrested over one, over five billion dollar worth of Colgate toothpicks from the Dallas store. That was this store, I mean, in Michigan State. Okay, the records are there. So then I said, if the, in the United States, Colgate can be counterfeited and be sold on the market, then you can imagine the vulnerability of developing an underdeveloped country like ours. That means we have to stand up tall and see what needs to be done. But this is a serious issue we are dealing with. It's a global issue. The next photograph shows Tura. Tura is a soap. Uh, most of the time, we use it. We use it also, it's on the Liberian market sometimes. It's hard to find these days, but you can't it. Some of the factors contributed to counterfeit and expired drugs and health products sac sac in, 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 in the medicine circulation include demand exceeding supply. People need more medicines than the uh, one that we have circulating. And so counterfeiters tend to you know, make use of the little gap, you know, the inability of medication and the inappropriate uh, uh, people being trained and all of that. People tend to use those cracks to penetrate. If you go into the rural areas, even in Monrovia, in urban areas, one of the reasons why uh, market women buy a lot of counterfeit, they believe that these people provide, uh, they, they, they provide services on the spot where you need it. 
that market woman with her son or the baby in with fever is afraid to leave the market table and for just a few minutes and go to the clinic because the bureaucracy in the clinic. You got to take records, go and get your card, stand and wait for the screener, and then the screener determine what the baby needs. She thinks that money is passing by. So there is a black vendor who goes to the market and says, look, I got a drug that can, that can kill this fever and even get rid of any other disease that the baby may have. And so they think that that service provision is on the spot. So it's more easier to access that service than to leave it and go to a clinic where you're going for a screener to look at your baby or so. So these are some of the things. <clears throat> also high price of medication. We, we think it's one of the key issues that is uh, undermining the issue or that is uh, highlighting or promoting the issue of a proliferation of counterfeit. Let's take anti-malaria for example. I asked for anti medial lomifantrin AL in a shop and it was being sold for five US dollars just for one round of treatment. Five US dollars, then I started to imagine how many persons in Logan Town, in Clara Town, in Point Four, or even on Broad Street can afford five US dollars if they cannot even afford one dollar a day to, 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 to feed themselves. So they would prefer going for a substandard counterfeit medicine that has been sold for maybe a hundred Liberian dollars compared to buying five US dollars, which is equated to 500 US, I mean Liberian dollars. So again, price tend to drive people eagerness to go for something substandard other than the one of quality. Next is the lack of appropriate drug legislation. And I think this is what I'm happy that the parliament is meeting to highlight this. The appropriate legislation in the sense that we may have some laws, but sometimes the penalties are a little bit lazy. Uh, a few days ago, I was talking to uh, Senator Nipan about this, and I said that perhaps this is one area we need to look at. If you look at our current law, it says that somebody caught in dealing with counterfeit should be fined $500, but not more than $1,500. Technically, for me, I think it's a window of opportunity for people to, you know, to, to venture into counterfeiting. If they are caught, fine. Because if they get caught, they will pay $500 or $1,500. If they don't, they don't get caught, they make thousands of dollars at the detriment of the lives of the citizens. But I think we need to make those laws very, very stringent so that people who are caught bringing counterfeit or selling counterfeit medicine on our market should have serious, serious fines that will deter all other people from dealing into that, especially if it is deliberate. Next is the lack the weak enforcement and, and, uh, the, the, uh, and, and penal section, I mean sanctions that we have on the law. We've already talked about some of the sanctions. And sometimes to even prosecute people through court is, a, is an uphill challenge because the lawyer wants to know what was the procedure used to gather your evidence. And it's, it's a big challenge for me to be able to say that I got a, a, a seizure warrant from a court when I already got a tip off that there is a guy in Claritown who have just uploaded a truck of counterfeit medicines, when do I go to court to get a warrant to go there and make sure that the, the, uh, the confiscation is done appropriately and rec recorded so that when the individual goes to court, I can now carry those evidence to court because the evidence was gathered through a legal procedure. So sometimes these kinds of little bottlenecks can serve as hindrances along the way. So weak enforcement is also another challenge like yesterday, I listened to a presentation and we talked about custom and immigration at the border points. We think if we, can, if we can have some of these things at that point, then we don't have to fire fight when the damage is already done. Because when the product is already on the market, the damage has been done. So we need to nab it right at the border. There should be no reason why a truck coming in across our border should not be inspected. And if there, is, if there are medicines on the truck, there should be no reason why custom officers and border security should not ask for documents that have given that person the right to import medicine to our country through that route. I think that simple mechanism, if it is used, and people who don't have documents for bringing medicine into the country, if they are stopped at that point, then we are preventing this whole firefight. We'll be saving a lot of money by dealing with the issue at that point. But in most instances, when these trucks cross and they are, their content are uploaded, at night, the, the products are already spread all over the country. Then we go after it as a regulatory body trying to confiscate. You don't even get 25, 30, or 50 percent because they hire them, they carry them into unknown places to confess, I mean, to, to camouflage them. You're not laying on them. 
So we think by dealing with it just at the point of entry would be a good way to deal with it. Also, the absence of drug regulation in some of our countries could be a major issue because in most instances, the Ministry of Health is left to deal with the issue of counterfeiting. Uh, and because of the bulkiness of activity and responsibility that some Ministry of Health has, they don't pay specific attention to this, the issue of quality. But we think when drug regulatory agencies are set up in all, neighbor, in all countries, all member countries, with a full responsibility to address this issue, then you have people with, with the responsibility to be able to do what they are supposed to do in the interest of the public. Lack of regulation by exporting countries within the, the uh, free trade zone is also another issue. People who export from other countries to our countries must have regulation to make sure that what is coming has been authenticated. Trade through several intermediaries, in most instances, sometimes donations that are coming to Liberia, we have to check them. I mean, it's true that we are a developing country, our people are in need of health care. We appreciate donations that are coming from wherever they come, but it's equally important, we have told donors repeatedly, that we appreciate the donation. But we as a government have a responsibility to make sure that when donations are coming to our country, we should review what you are bringing, we should approve of what you are bringing, we should authenticate the quality of what you are bringing. Because with all good intention of some donors, we also have information that some donors unscrupulously get money from, from uh, I mean, international institutions, but they intentionally buy soft tender products for our countries because we are underprivileged people who are not, who don't have a voice in saying what we need and what we don't need. So we appreciate donation, but please, we want good quality donation, donated medical goods. We don't want soft center medications coming. If you intend to donate soft center medication, we don't want it, take it back. And let Africa or West Africa try to invest its own money in buying good quality medicine for our citizens and for ourselves, because these medicines are killing us. We don't need it if they are soft center. So lack of political will, corruption, conflict of interest, all of these were hammered yesterday as some of the issues. So political will should be there, but should be also backed by commitment and dedication, you know, so that we speak with one voice and we, we are committed to doing what we say we will do and we remain committed in the interest of the public and the citizens that we serve. Inefficient cooperation between stakeholders, uh, also among several things, because Customs say, well, we are here to collect our duties, that a regulatory burden that you want to bring, and by checking the quality of medicine before they pass, please, we don't want you to be an obstacle to duty collection. Trust me, we believe in supporting government in case revenue collection, we can in no way uh, stop that, but we are equally interested in the quality of medicines and health products that are coming in. We want these people to pay their taxes, but we equally want them to bring good quality products for the citizenry, because if you collect Four, five hundred U.S. dollars as tax, and the medication wage war on the citizenry that will cost us two, three million dollars to save those lives. What have we done? We collected four, five hundred dollars so that we can spend four, five million dollars to save those lives that we are allowed to be exposed to risk. So these are things that we need to deal with. So, from a technical perspective, the WHO defines counterfeit medicines, and it's important because. As we use the terminology counterfeit medicine from a public health perspective, we can only do it wisely if we can actually define counterfeit medicine and put it into perspective. A counterfeit medicine is one which is deliberately and fraudulently mislabeled with respect to identity and our source. Counterfeiting can apply to both branded and generic products, some of which were said here yesterday, and counterfeit products may include products with the correct ingredients or with the wrong ingredients, or without active ingredients, or with insufficient active ingredients, or with fake packaging. So any of those can, comp can comprise of counterfeit medicines. The counterfeit trade, trademark goods shall mean any goods, <coughs> including packaging, bearing without authorization a trademark which is identical to the trademark of valid to the trademark valid of the valid registered uh, in respect of such goods, or which cannot be distinguished okay, in its essential aspects uh, from such a trademark, and which thereby infringes 
the rights of the owner of the trademark in question under the law of the country of importation. And we highlighted this because we tend to conflict counterfeit medicine with intellectual property rights. As once it becomes intellectual property rights, <coughs> then it is removed from the whole issue of a regulation, and then trade people begin to look at it. So I think it was a good idea to bring the people in custom trade and all of that together with the regulatory issues to be able to look at that. Because the issue about counterfeiting sometimes can be a cross-cutting, I mean, can be an overlapping issue in different areas. There is currently no universal agreed definition for what used to why, what used to be widely known as counterfeit medicines. Pending negotiation among member states, WHO will continue to use the term soft standard, spurious, falsified, and forcing labor, falsified, and counterfeit medical products, SSFFC. So this is a new global terminology that is being used. WHO is no longer using the terminology counterfeit alone, but include all the other things because, as I said earlier, not all counterfeit products are soft standard. Some counterfeit product may just contain all of the item ingredients and good enough for the patients to use, but because they were counterfeited without the approval of the original designer, so they have violated inter intellectual property rights. While the universal group agreed a definition would be useful, it is unlikely to alter member states' position who have uh, relied on their own domestic legislation, some of which is based on the old definition from WHO to sanction offenders for many years. So it's level of us. Maybe in Liberia, we see that all commodities or all hard products or medicines that are not registered are defined as counterfeit. That would be our definition. Or if we say any product that is falsified deliberately, that carry the uh, logo of another company without justification can be counterfeit, we can also. So we as a country, it's level of us to define what our own terminology of counterfeit would be. There is a many crime convention that took place somewhere around 2011, and uh, we indicated the website for references to people who will want to read that convention. It talks about offend, offense. Each party, for example, government, shall take the necessary legislative and other measures to establish as offenses under its domestic law the, inter the uh, intentional uh, manufacturing of counterfeit medical products, IT substance, excipients, parts of material, and accessories. For the definition, the term counterfeit shall mean false representation as regard identity or source. Therefore, if you intentionally manufacture a, a medicine having a false representation of identity and or source, you are a criminal. That's the medical convention. So people who intentionally do these things should be referred to as criminal and should be punished under the laws. Advantages. The definition follows existing national laws. Example, soft standard is merely that which fulfills national standard. So these definitions can be universal without depending, without uh, uh, appending existing uh, approaches. <laughs> Men's real is simplified. If the product is unregistered, that is proof of the guilt of mine. Only criminals can deal in unregistered products. So technically, if you have a product that you are circulating that is not unregistered, you should be considered a criminal. Maybe we can look at that. But a suit of exception is needed. Though, example, unregistered product in humanitarian emergency or placebos that are being used in clinical routine or clinical trial and research can be considered. So we may say that donor agencies that are coming to render assistance to the people of Liberia by donation, there can be exception. We can grant them a waiver for registration because it's in the interest of public health safety. But anything that has been done in a commercial sector that is not registered by the country, we can say that you are bringing it illegally and so it can be uh, extracted as a crime. Laws needs to be strengthened, but parliament should not have to reinvent the wheel, maybe. They can use model law with best practices, then let them innovate around that and see how they can be visited, I mean, modified to suit national tips. Currently, we have the AU model law as it relates to regulatory authorities that we set up by member countries. Maybe we can look at that and see how we can reframe it so that all member countries can have at least a regulatory act that will ensure that people 
monitor the quality of nursing entering each country. Nursing crime is a threat to public health and life. All medicines must be of good quality. New laws are needed to make fake and substandard medicines a criminal, a criminal offense. The law must, however, cover medicines quality and patient safety only and not intellectual property, IP. Not interfere with humanitarian relief because then we'll be creating bureaucratic bottleneck, which uh, should not be the case. Should not also interfere with medical research that we have the Ebola research ongoing to prevent uh, any recurrence in the future. Those are researches that will have to continue because we have uh, emerging diseases. Now we're talking about Ebola. I mean, yeah, we have had Ebola. We're talking about Zika. Uh, there are other diseases like Marburg. We're talking about them. Emerging diseases. So Africa or West Africa have to uh, consolidate this effort in the area of research so that we can see what needs to be done. And we just talk about antimicrobial resistance. Uh, we think these are areas that we need to concentrate on because we live in a tropical zone. Not all the diseases that we have here that people in the West suffer. So they tend to pay more attention to diseases in the West. And we are in Africa. We live in our region where we have different types of diseases. So it's only fair enough for us to make sure that we push our scientists to do a lot more research so that we can do something in our region. We should also foster cross-border cooperation and law enforcement. We think it's very, very important because we just talk about cross-border activity and with, our, with the porosity of our borders, except with network with, with our member countries, we'll be able to do very little. Uh, falsified medicines is intentionally and deliberately sustained. Okay. Sustainable medicines can be accidental or accidentally or uh, negligently bad quality. Unregistered medicine is not licensed by the government and sold illegally. So again, these three, these four, uh, 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 three above definition could be something that maybe we can put in as a part of our, you know, uh, uh, definition as it relates to putting together new legal instruments that will battle the issue of counterfeit medicine in the future. But we should remember that medicine's quality is different from intellectual property, like I just said. So we cannot be using IP or intellectual property as it relates to medicine quality. Counterfeit medicines violate intellectual property, that is trademark and, and patents. So the people in IP can deal with uh, the terminology counterfeit, but then we can be dealing with unregistered, substandard, falsified, and all of that. Well, to wrap it up, Medicine regulation is, uh, this is a global picture of medicine regulation, not only in Africa, but the world over. And if you look, you see steps. Different countries are at different levels. Some people are way up there, refer to them as a developed nation. Though they have challenges too, but uh, they are way up there. I think they are sure that in their supply system, they are able to, they have system, or they have means by which they can detect. Other people are below them, coming all the way down, all the way to the end. Some people got nothing in place. So, looking at the ladder of the global regulation practices, the question would be, where are we, West Africa? Where do we find ourselves? Are we here, or are we here, or somewhere along the line? Maybe as we think about it and move into the future, we can begin to think, if we find ourselves somewhere here, how soon do we intend to be here? Depending on what mechanism we put in place, depending on the legal framework we put in place, depending on the law enforcement of, uh, tools, that we're putting in place to make sure that we strengthen regulatory agencies and responsible governmental institutions for interagency collaboration for us to move up the ladder. We can actually tell whether we are here or we'll soon be there, or we intend to remain here for a while. It's level for us to tell where we want to be. In conclusion, access to quality, safe, and efficacious drugs is essential and should not be underestimated. Necessary to set up national regulatory authorities and feature their activity more permanently in the national governance process and provided, and provided adequate support and budget. And we highlight the support and budget because it's not an easy thing to run a regulatory agency that is, that is, ensure, that is supposed to ensure that all medicines circulating are of good quality and that people who access the medicine are accessing the right quality of medicine. Liberia is a small country by size population, but we are equally big. Because almost all of our country, all of our counties that border neighboring countries, citizens from those neighboring countries come to seek health care in Liberia. The evidence is clear. If you want to look back, for example, 
We have most of our uh, 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 citizens from Guinea that cross over to, to, to Liberia to come from her to come to the clinic on a day-to-day -day basis. Because these are common families, they live across borders. These borders are their imaginary lines. But the people who live there have commonality in culture. Their way of doing things are just common and they interact on a day-to-day -day basis. The same thing with Sierra Leone, the same thing with Africans. Okay. So by just addressing the health system in Liberia, you are addressing a system that will cater to the needs of the people that will affect all of those other countries. Okay. Necessary to sell, we talk about that. The need to be proactive and to ensure compliance is also important. So the regulatory authority in Liberia, for example, our national budget, or our annual budget to support the regulatory activity in Liberia is $400,000. <clears throat> that money can only pay our staff to run our quality control laboratory to test those drugs, photos and graphs that we saw up there, to make sure that their, their quality is authenticated on that. It will cost not less than a million dollars at least to run just the lab. Let's talk about the inspectorate where people are supposed to go out on a regular basis to, to, to check these medications. Then you have the registration department. Okay. Then you have the network to make sure pharmacal vision and drug safety issue in the clinic when the patient has ADR to be able to report that. So we will merely beg now that the parliament is meeting and the members of the parliament are here to see that in spite of the challenges that we have, we know we have a lot of things to work for. But let's see what we can do to at least augment the budget for the regulatory authority to make it effective and efficient. As I was here this morning, I was just talking to the colleagues sitting across the table I got information that the DEA just arrested a truck. A whole truck loaded with expired medicines. Whether they were intended to carry across the border and relabel, or they were taking it to another part of the country, we don't know. That investigation is currently ongoing. To be able to network between these things, you need logistics, vehicles to move around. Currently, we run an office where there is only one single pickup. When you see that pickup, is, it will be halted because you will not tempt to even go, not even southeast, you will not even tempt because of the difficulty of the terrain. So we have to see what needs to be done to step up and make sure that we nail some of these things. We have a committed team. The government has spent money to train these people. They are prepared to work, but we just have to support them to see what needs to be done. So the issue of a budget and, and budgetary support logistics cannot be underestimated. Industry to provide support to regulation effort rather than counter, rather than counter the activity of regulatory, uh, regulatory effort in the interest of public health. High-tech hospitals with the best trained professional health workers with soft standard counterfeit expired medicines and other health products will yield a total failure. So we can build all of the hospitals around, the, I mean some of the best tech hospitals around the whole of West Africa and, and train all of our medical doctors, except those doctors and health practitioners have reliable, high-quality medicines to use, our investment will be in vain. So we think investing in high quality medicine will, will not be a waste, but it will be an investment in the interest of public health. Having said that, I will now wrap up and pause and just leave it to you and say thank you very much for listening.